Welcome in the latest episode of that SEC podcast brought to you by Twisted T and my bookie. I'm your host, Michael Bratton. Go by SEC Mike on Twitter. And no Cousin Shane, no clowns, thank goodness, on this episode. But you know why, because it's Tuesday. It means it's a Stephen Lassen Tuesday. We're going to join... We're going to be joined by our good buddy, Stephen Lassen, senior editor, Athlon Sports, in just a minute to preview the upcoming week, get his thoughts on what happened last week, and kind of go over some midseason type grades with our guy, Stephen. So, hey, before we get to that, a little bit of a, it was a little bit of a slow day in the SEC, but we do got the kickoff times for week eight. Going to get to that in just a second, but... Um, I just thought this was kind of interesting. It's week seven. And on ESPN's website, they list ticket prices for the get uh, the lowest p- ticket price you can get for a bunch of SEC games. And I, I this always gives you a, a good indication of the the most in demand, obviously, most in demand game, but where the fans are, are gonna be rabid for this type of matchup. And Arkansas at Alabama, that's the lowest get-in price at $37. And even uh, as I say that, on Monday, Alabama announced Arkansas returned some of the tickets they were given for this game. So not a very in-demand game with Arkansas struggles. Auburn at LSU. uh, Sorry, I don't think I gave out the price there. Arkansas, Alabama, $37. Tickets as low as $37, according to ESPN. Their schedule there. Auburn at LSU, $48, which that's that's annually one of the best games in the – that's probably the steal of the week right there in the SEC. That's not a deal. That's a steal. Auburn at LSU, 48 bucks. Missouri at Kentucky, huge game. I don't care that they both lost last week. This could be the battle for second place. And, hell, Missouri still in it to win the East – Kentucky, you're going to need some help, but you're still in it as well. Get in as low as $64. Florida at South Carolina, get in as low as 80 This is already a sellout. Williams-Brice, night game. It's going to be heavily anticipated. And how about this? This will throw people for a loop, I bet. Georgia at Vanderbilt, get in price $101. That's, that's a a couple factors there. Georgia coming to town. They're going to take over that stadium. Vanderbilt Stadium, obviously, under construction, so seating is a little limited. But the number two on that list, Georgia at Vanderbilt for 101 bucks, the lowest get-in price. And then Texas A&M at Tennessee, $192. I just thought that was pretty interesting. Nearly double any other game. Tennessee coming off a bye. A&M coming off a tough, tough loss. At home, Paul Feinbaum, his show's going to be there on Friday, SEC Nation on Saturday. I'll be there with Paul. I talked to Billy Lucci this week. He's going to be in town. I mean, this is going to be be one hell of a game. Texas A&M at Tennessee. Big, big game for both those programs. If they want to have the season they think they can still have, must win for those. But hey, so that's this upcoming weekend, obviously. We're in week seven. Week eight, the SEC announced the kickoff times for week eight, October 21st games here. Let's run these down real quick. Mississippi State at Arkansas, noon Eastern on ESPN, right after game day. And someone joked online, every Arkansas game is going to be at noon now this year. And I said, not so fast, my friend. The Arkansas Hope Games, yeah, they're all, well. It, it's a, even worse for them. 11 a.m. Central Time. That's probably going to be standard for Arkansas. But their away games, they <laughs> that's when the, that's when they get a night game. When they're on the road, much more difficult environment. Leave it to the SEC. I don't know what they have against Arkansas. We love you here on on this show, Arkansas. But the SEC league office and their kickoff times, they seem to hate you. Tennessee at Alabama. 3.30 Eastern, 2.30 Central. This is the CBS game. Ooh, boy. Tennessee's got to win. Ar- uh, Alabama's got to beat Arkansas if this game's going to live up to the hype. But 
The fact that CBS selected it gives you an indication of what they're thinking. Could be one hell of a game. South Carolina at Missouri. Revenge game, perhaps. 3.30 Eastern, 2.30 Central, SEC Network. That's annually a, a hell of a game. Uh, Beamer's not beaten drink yet. Will he do it in the Northern Columbia? We'll find out. It's Ole Miss at Auburn. Hugh Freeze, Lane Kiffin battle here. 7 o'clock Eastern, 6 Central on ESPN. That's going to be one hell of a game, night game there. And then last but not least, so this is what I'm saying. This I understand. You do this to Army, cool. I'm good with it. You do it with Arkansas every week, I'm not cool with it. Army at LSU, 7.30 Eastern, 6.30 Central on the SEC Network. Good luck, Army. You're going to need it in Baton Rouge come Saturday night. But all right, <laughs> that's all the trolling I got. Uh, let's kick it over to our outstanding interview with Stephen Lassen, Senior Editor of Athlon Sports. All right, hey, it's a Tuesday, so you know what that means. It means it's a Stephen Lassen Tuesday. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Mike, I'm doing great. It's good, as always, to talk to you. Another great weekend of games. Last Saturday, looking forward to uh, this Saturday. Hard, hard to believe we're already at week seven. It's like mm -hmm. the football season is flying by. Where's it going? <laughs> yeah, I know. So the midway mark is, is where we're at here, Stephen, so... Uh, I got a couple questions to get uh, going with you here. But before we get to that, you know, we don't have to run by all these games because there were some that were not that competitive. But um, any takeaways or anything from uh, the week that was in the SEC with Alabama going on the road beating AM? That one certainly stands out. Number one, Georgia just steamrolling an undefeated Kentucky team, uh, LSU ends the dream season for Missouri. Both those teams still have everything in front of them, so it's it's not disaster for Como or anything like that. But uh, and, and, of course, Ole Miss beat Arkansas. F Florida kept Billy Napier employed for at least another week. Uh, <laughs> anything stand out to you last weekend? A lot stood out to me. First of all, I'm not wearing a clown outfit or makeup here, but I will say I am an idiot, too, for believing that Texas A&M uh, was going to beat Alabama on Saturday. So I have to eat my dish of crow here and soak it all in for, for being for being an idiot and picking against Alabama. But no, I, I think we've now seen two challengers over the, the course of the last couple of weeks. Ole Miss and Texas A&M have a chance to sort of solidify their place atop the SEC West, knock off Alabama. Here we are a couple of weeks later, Looks like the path runs through Tuscaloosa once again, and two teams have tried to swing at Alabama, and they missed. Um, I think on the LSU-Missouri game, I mean, first of all, just it was a fun game because of the offensive back and forth. Um, LSU's defense making some nice plays in the second half uh, to help uh, Brian Kelly's team escape uh, Missouri with a win. But it was important for for LSU to to win that game and try to keep pace with Alabama in the SEC, setting up that showdown later in the season. No shame for Missouri, though. I mean, they fought like crazy for 60 minutes. Still a lot to play for uh, the rest of the year. And, and you mentioned the uh, the showdown in Athens. I, I was hoping we'd get a game, uh, but I think the spread on you know the, the week leading up to it was 14, 17 points. I think Georgia showed why they're the number one team in the country. I think that was probably the most complete performance they've had from start to finish Started fast. Some of those questions that we had about offensive first quarters, they weren't there. Carson Beck is building off that strong performance against Auburn. Uh, so I think uh, Georgia solidifying its place at number one in the country and Alabama, of course, uh, taking care of another challenger, probably my biggest uh, takeaways from last Saturday. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, and I know, uh, heck, I think last week you, you said you still like Alabama as uh, kind of that team to beat in the West. So clearly you you must still have them uh, in that high regard. Are, have, I, I hate to even ask this because this, this bothers me when we're at the halfway point and I'm asking you, to, did someone lock up the division? But do you believe that Alabama locked up the SEC West on Saturday? I don't. So – I, let me, I guess, kind of make a weird argument here. I've got Alabama one in my SEC West power rankings. 
And I think they are the team to beat. I think clearly the favorite at this point, if you ask me to pick who I think makes it there, I think it's Alabama. But there are some road trips. I mean, going to Auburn, going to Kentucky, they still have to play Tennessee. And you know, some of there's a potential some potential landmines there for an Alabama team that the margin for error compared to previous seasons is a little smaller. I have Ole Miss at two by virtue of the win over LSU. But this is kind of the catch that I wanted to throw out there. I think LSU is better positioned to challenge Alabama because they still have to play Alabama in a few weeks. Gives maybe this defense time to figure some things out. Also, Ole Miss still has to play Georgia. Uh, So I think if you're an LSU fan and you're sitting here, it's like, yeah, you've got the loss to Ole Miss, but you're looking at Ole Miss still having to play Georgia. You know, you're going to get Alabama in a few weeks. There's still an opportunity here for LSU. So I think at this point, I've kind of knocked A&M down to four on its own tier with Alabama, Ole Miss, and LSU kind of in that top tier with Alabama separating itself uh, for first place in the West by now. And what do you make of this jumbled mess that we call the SEC East under, of course, Georgia? I mean, they're until, I mean, heck, they, they're not really even being tested much aside from South Carolina. Heck, got them by halftime, but uh, they dominated the second half. So what do you, what do you make now that uh, Kentucky's lost, Missouri's lost, Tennessee's lost, Florida's lost? I mean, everybody loses, but uh, n- now Kentucky, Missouri, I mean, that's that, – that both their backs are against the wall. They they can't afford a loss here if they have any dreams of getting to Atlanta. No question about it. I, I think first of all, to to answer your question at the top of the East, it's Georgia. Georgia is getting ready to run away with this division Saturday night. If you had any doubts about kind of uh, is there a challenger? Can someone challenge them in the East? I think they were answered. Uh, they made a pretty strong statement on Saturday night against Kentucky. I've got Tennessee at two. But I don't think there's a ton of separation between Tennessee, Kentucky, and Missouri. I think if you wanted to make the argument for Kentucky going forward, uh, games against Missouri and Tennessee are at home. They do have to play Alabama in crossover play, albeit the game is in Lexington. So Kentucky has a pretty favorable path uh, to that second spot. Tennessee, of course, still has to play Alabama, get Texas A&M this week. If it feels like Two through four, in my mind, are still very unsettled. But we might also know a lot by Saturday night because Tennessee getting A&M, this Kentucky-Missouri game, we might have a little bit more clarity in the East. If if Missouri loses and, and you drop your second SEC game, I think that kind of tells us that Kentucky's probably the biggest challenger to Tennessee uh, for that second spot. Mm. Yeah, and uh, so we'll preview the games in just a second here, Stephen. But I did ask you... Uh, to come with a list prepared for uh, your quarterback rankings now that we are at the midway point of the SEC regular season. Uh, Maybe just, uh, you know, top five, what have you, and and maybe any other honorable mentions that you have that are are close to that range. Who do you have as uh, the best quarterbacks in the first half of the SEC season? Let's start at number one. I don't think there's any debate here. After the last couple of weeks, I've got Jaden Daniels at number one, nearly 400 yards of total offense on Saturday uh, against Missouri. He has carried this offense. I think you could argue he's carried this team uh, through the first uh, you know six games of the season. You could argue at, outside of Caleb Williams at USC, Michael Penix at Washington, he's playing as well as any quarterback in the country. So for me, easy, number one, Jaden Daniels, two through six or so. Uh, you know, this is an order I think you can change um, a lot. I think you go with a couple different names here. Maybe I'm being prisoner of the moment. I like Carson Beck at two. Uh, you look at his, you know, eight point nine yards per play. You know, you look at his the last two performances against the second half against Auburn and the performance against Kentucky on, on Saturday. Just you know, first half statement coming out throwing. And I just like the confidence that the staff has, has sort of given him over the last couple of weeks. So I feel like Carson Beck has taken that big step forward. I've got him at two. I've got Jackson Dart at three, Spencer Rattler at four, Brady Cook five, and KJ Jefferson six. With the caveat, two through six are very close. If I was to do a top 25 nationally, they all would be 
somewhere 10 through 20 probably. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, so I like the fact feel, that you feel, you... feel free to critique me or pick that apart, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just like the fact that you've kind of you've mixed it up quite a bit based on where you had a lot of these guys in the preseason, which that's what you should do. You should react to to where guys actually are. Um, and maybe this isn't a fair question, but did you give any consideration, and I know that's just your top there, but any consideration at all to uh, Graham Mertz? Uh, or not that obviously he'd be number one or anything, but I've just been wildly impressed with how I don't think they ask a lot of him, in, in fairness, but he is... He has delivered more often than not in Billy Napier's in offense. What's your thoughts on uh, Mertz? I think, first of all, if you're completing about 80% of your passes, you're doing something right. Uh, so I think you're, you're right. Florida hasn't asked a lot of him, but he's also doing enough in that offense. When they can get the run game going and the efficiency and staying on schedule, You know, he's been exactly what they needed. I, I don't. I, if you're asking him to be... More than that, I don't think Graham Mertz is capable right now of of being that kind of difference maker. But when when things are going well for Florida's offense, he's sort of the perfect kind of point guard in that system. You know, uh, to answer your question, yeah, I, I did. I, I thought the next three after the top six, Milro, Mertz, and Milton, I think in some sort of order. Connor Wigman, I did not rank him or consider him because he was hurt. If he was healthy, I think easily. Uh, one of the top six in the SEC. But this this cluster of quarterbacks, I think once you get outside of the top six, Milrow has shown flashes of potential. I think he's coming off his best game against Texas A&M. Um, Milton's been in, inconsistent this Saturday. He may have an opportunity to take a big step forward against Texas A&M. And Mertz has just been, I think, pretty solid. Th- there were a couple things I'll throw out there that I was thinking about when when doing this. You look at KJ Jefferson, he's thrown six interceptions so far this season. That's more than 2021 and 2022 all all, all season um, as far as being the starting quarterback. And that's not necessarily on him with the offensive uh, question marks that that Arkansas has had with the offensive line. You look at Brady Cook, sixth in the SEC by ESPN in terms of QBR, but he's second in quarterback rating. Uh, probably, I think, maybe one of the biggest surprises just nationally has been his growth from last year to this year and even from week one to uh, uh, to week six. And you look at Spencer Rattler, his average depth of target is only 7.2. It's one of the lowest in the SEC. But this is also, I think, where you have to sort of sift through the situation with the offensive line concerns that they've had a lot of short passing, just needing to uh, you know, get it out of his hands so he doesn't take a beating this season. So I think uh, maybe the storyline for me is Jaden Daniels has separated himself right now as the number one quarterback, but I really feel like this the league itself, two through nine or ten, that's a pretty deep group of quarterbacks. If, if we don't have Dev Leary or, or Will Rogers in that conversation when they were pretty much pick to be uh top five at the in the preseason by most that's a that's a pretty deep group of quarterbacks in the sec right now and i apologize Stephen, for going back but uh, i i wanted to ask you this i forgot to write it down here in middle of the season Stephen. if i don't write something down it's just it ain't gonna happen so <laughs> but i thought of it uh while while you were going through the quarterbacks there uh last week texas oklahoma uh quick thoughts on that game because for me, Stephen, I mean, that that was probably the best game I've seen all year. And it, it lived up to the billing, and I didn't see anybody pick Oklahoma to win that game. I've been wildly impressed with Oklahoma all year, but even I thought Texas, given what they had shown and, and how they dominated Alabama, I expected them to win. But credit to the Sooners, they got it done. Uh, what was your thoughts on that game? And uh, how high did that rate for uh, the best game that you've seen this year? Oh, no question. I think it's it's was one of the better games that we've seen this season, um, just as far as high stakes, rivalry, competitiveness. The, the first quarter itself was one of the craziest first quarters I think I've seen uh, in a long time. It's just the how, how that one played out. I think and maybe maybe this is a bit of a hot take, but Texas and Oklahoma, I think both are back to some extent. 
you know, we Texas is a, a, a top 10 team. The fact that Oklahoma under Brent Venables in year two, you know, he came in with a plan. I uh, wasn't just going to go heavy into the portal year one to get a quick fix. You're starting to see that pay off on the offensive and defensive lines with the way that they're recruiting. They're ready to come into the SEC. When you have that, when your offensive line and defensive line make that big of a jump from last season to this season, the depth on, on defense is better too. So I think it, t- we gave a lot of praise to Texas after beating Alabama, and rightfully so. But after last year, there was a lot of questions about, hey, Oklahoma finished six and seven. They had a lot of bad luck. Looks like they're they're on schedule too. So I, I think a lot of credit should go to Brent Venables and the staff for getting Oklahoma to this position to where they could be top five. I think you know the to me, to me the difference in the game was line of scrimmage. Oklahoma measured up, and Dylan Gabriel at quarterback, whether it was passing or rushing, uh, he outplayed Quinn Ewers on, on Saturday. I said this on your show in the preseason. I think they're going to play again. I think they're going to play again in Dallas, and I think there's a good chance that it's a a playoff a, a playoff play in game uh, in the Big Twelve Championship game. Yeah, I can't wait to see that if it goes down again. Uh, now, I, again, I apologize. I didn't prepare you for this one, but I I just did uh, Mike Griffith Dog Nation show, and he asked me this, and uh, kind of caught me off guard. And I I don't know if I had the best answer, but I'm just kind of curious to know where you'd go. And then, and then I'll let you know where I went. But he asked me, who's the SEC coach of the year up to this point? Does, uh, who, who tops your list there? Man, it's a good question. Um, maybe Eli Drinkowitz. That's what I said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, I kind of was going through the candidates in my mind. You know, I, I think had, Ole Miss beaten Alabama, I think Lane Kiffin would be at the top of that list. I think it's always coaches like Nick Saban and Kirby Smart will never get probably consideration for coach of the year when they should. I think you could give some coach of the year consideration to Kirby for reloading. And then they, if they end up being 13 and 0 at the end of the year, but I would probably just go with Drinkowitz just based upon their top 25. They've sitting here at five and one. It's clear that his changes on offense have, have worked. And they are, you know, a couple plays away from beating LSU and being in the top 15, maybe uh going into this week. So I that they are they are much better than I thought coming into the preseason. And so I, I that's one of the reasons why I would give it to Drinkowitz. Right. That and uh, you know, maybe this is not fair to even put this into the conversation, but I think it is. I mean, the guy was on arguably the hottest seat in the league too. So, yeah. and people think that's easy. You know, you lose a game, there's, the fans are putting for sale signs in your yard. I mean, it's we're nuts down here, Steve. We were just talking about it. I mean, hell, there's talk Mississippi State may try to run off Zach Arnett after, what, five, six games. So yeah. <laughs> we're, we're nuts down here. So uh, there's a lot of pressure that goes with that. There's a lot of things that people don't even consider. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I think I think drink is kind of that lead, lead candidate right now. But also, too, I think the, I don't know if humbleness is the right word or sort of realization that you have to go out and hire somebody to be your offensive coordinator and take that off your plate, step back, to be the CEO of the program because Missouri has been recruiting well, handling NIL. And you look at their you know, their start to the season, that showdown against Kansas State, big-time win. They go to St. Louis. That's a huge opportunity. They get the win over Memphis, and they set up that uh, showdown with a great atmosphere in Como uh, with a close loss to LSU. So I, I think sort of realizing what you need to do to help your program take a step forward is part of this process as a head coach. So I think he deserves a lot of credit for going out and hiring Kirby Moore and then letting him have sort of the autonomy to make the changes that you need to get that offense on track. Yeah, and sticking on the theme, Stephen, of uh, just kind of midseason report here, uh, biggest surprises for you in a, in a positive light could be literally anything. Could be a team, could be just offense, could be just defense, could be a coach, could be a position group, could be a single player. What What is, you know, two or three things that stand out to you across the SEC as the biggest pleasant surprises 
at the midway point of the SEC season? I'll start in a surprise. I'll go with the team that we just talked about. I think Missouri, probably maybe the biggest surprise to me in the country. I, I thought when you go into the preseason, they were probably going to be picked fifth or sixth in the SEC East, and there's a good chance they finish second. And it's sort of that growth on offense to go with the defense that should be pretty good. I know it had its issues on Saturday against LSU, and maybe it's a, it's struggling a little bit more than we thought in the preseason. But Missouri being a top 25 team with potential to finish second, I think is a big surprise. I think on the other side of things, I think Arkansas in the offensive line, probably one of the bigger surprises for me. If you told me, you know, hey, Arkansas has got question marks on the offensive line any preseason, I would just assume that Sam Pittman and he would figure it out. Even though he's the head coach, uh, his offensive line background would shine through and they would have one of the better offensive lines in the league, but they really haven't, which has also hindered um, KJ Jefferson and the entire offense uh, to, to go with that. And another surprise, I think, when we talk about quarterbacks, has just been the the quarterbacks themselves. You know, we came into this preseason with, you know, Will Rogers, Devin Leary, um, Jaden Daniels, KJ Jefferson were at the top. And we just talked about how Jaden Daniels has been the best quarterback in the league. But there's a really strong, like, second tier here. It's been the development of Carson Beck. Jackson Dart, I think, has been a pleasant surprise. Um, you look at Brady Cook. You know, his improvement from last season to this year is night and day different. So I think maybe on the surprising front, for me, it's just the quarterbacks were a question in the preseason. But I think we're finding out that they were unknown, but they're actually probably this is a really solid group of signal callers in the league this year. Mm. All right, Steven. So let's uh, take a look ahead to the to the upcoming week and uh, a lot of interesting games. I don't know if there's. There's one in particular that stands out from the rest, but one that's kind of captured me, Texas A&M at Tennessee. Uh, thoughts on this matchup, Stephen, and uh, just just a critical game, really, for for both teams. If they want to have an excellent season, this is, a, this is one you got to have, given who the, each of them have uh, left on their schedule. No doubt about it. I, I think it's... It's probably the biggest game on the schedule for me this week, but it's also the biggest mystery because I really don't know what to make of this game. You know, I was I was curious when the lines came out on Sunday to see who was favored because I thought there was a chance that Texas A&M was going to be favored in this game, but you know, Tennessee being a slight favorite. I think a couple things that jump out to me right away is it's the number 1 rushing offense in the SEC against the number one rush defense. Tennessee being the rushing offense, A&M being the rush defense. So already you have this interesting line of scrimmage battle set to unfold. Uh, this A&M defense has been rock solid. They were great on the, the de- defensive line was great on Saturday, not so much the secondary. And you have uh, Tennessee's offensive line getting Mays back at center a few weeks ago against South Carolina. Can that group over the bye week really start to mesh going forward? They're going to need it. So I, I think I, I'm curious to see how this line of scrimmage battle plays out because Tennessee can say the same thing. You know, uh, A&M only averaged 1.9 yards per carry against Alabama. Uh, and when it came to, to rushing offense and Tennessee has been good against the run and they're also good at creating havoc. So I, I think line of scrimmage, I also think quarterbacks, because if you're Joe Milton, you're watching Jalen Milrow just torch the A&M secondary going, Hey, uh, you know, we, we could do that too. Uh, so this this might be the game that maybe Milton and some of those big passes that haven't been there like we saw last year with Hendon Hooker, maybe this is the week that uh, Tennessee can get their passing game on track. Is it overly simplistic, Stephen, to say uh, a high-scoring game favors Tennessee and a low-scoring game favors A&M? What's your thoughts on that? I agree with that. I, I think if I'm Tennessee, I want to make A&M sort of uncomfortable um offensively and that and that's something i I wonder when it comes to offensive line and defensive line is tempo you know if you're tennessee can you use your tempo to wear down texas ames defensive line because that group if you let that group control the game you know tennessee's probably going to lose on saturday i think if you're tennessee using tempo big plays getting that rushing attack going, taking some of the pressure off Milton. Maybe he can use his legs a little bit. You know, that to me, that's the formula uh, for Tennessee to win. And I think a higher scoring game 
benefits them. I think if it's a lower scoring play to the defense, um, I think that definitely favors A&M. Yeah, so it sounds like some Aggies could be faking some injuries come Saturday based on what <laughs> Steven's saying. I, no. <laughs> I think I think tempo is going to play a huge uh, role in this game. And also, one other factor, too. I think A&M's second-half offense, they, they didn't score an offensive touchdown against Arkansas, and they didn't score one in the second half against um, Alabama. So I think second-half sort of adjustments by mm. A&M to get on the scoreboard. You know, they scored on defense and special teams against Arkansas. And, and, and just in general, this may be a game where – I don't know if you could punt the ball times in your opponent's territory or uh, be having some end of game management if you're Jimbo Fisher. Yeah, and uh, obviously much has been made about Joe Milton and the and the hype and all this, and you know, not that he's been horrible. I I think Stephen, I think it's fair to say people that just that 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 thought he sucked, they think they still think he's horrible, and. You know, the people that thought he was otherworldly or whatever, they've been mad, you know, massively disappointed, which I, I guess that's fair. But I, th- I think the truth is somewhere in between. Um, he's not been awful. He's not been incredible. He's, he's been middle of the road. But to your point, Stephen, this A&M, if they control the line of scrimmage, if they can stop the run, they're going to win this game. And Tennessee better get used to that because up next after that's Alabama. Same deal. They, they, you're not going to run on Alabama and Tuscaloosa, and oh yeah, a couple of weeks down the line, you got Georgia coming to town, and we could throw Kentucky and Missouri in here too. Until last week, Missouri was the SEC's leader in run defense. So, uh, and Kentucky and Missouri are, are away games too for Tennessee. So, this is a week, Stephen. After two weeks with coming off a bye, where I know. It, Tennessee's identity appears to be running the ball, but and and they don't need Joe Milton to be hen and hooker. I'm not saying that, but he's got he's got to be the the leader with with his arm in this offense. He just has to be because I I think this next couple of weeks is going to be there's going to be a lot of losses for Tennessee if they if their passing game does not get going, and it, I think it has to start Saturday. A and M has shown to get Jalen Milrow. And Miami's quarterback, it made them look like superstars. So, do you are you with me here on on this line of thinking where this this has got to be a Joe Milton's got to have a, a good game for Tennessee to come out ahead on this one? He really does. I think first of all, to to go back to the line of scrimmage conversation, if Tennessee has a good day running the football, they're probably going to win this game. If they're pushing around A and M's front, that's a good sign for Tennessee. But I think based upon what we've seen so far, where can you beat AM? It's Tyler Van Dyke throwing the deep passes. It's Jalen Milrow throwing the deep passes. Probably unlikely that anybody's just going to, Tennessee can just go out and push around Texas AM for 300 rushing yards. But if they do, then this one, this one may not even be close. They may not even need Joe Milton to, to have a good afternoon. But I think the stats sort of tell us where Tennessee, the, the offense is missing so far. You know, you look, go back to last season. They had 40 completions of 30 plus yards. They only have eight so far in 2023. Now the season isn't done, but we're about halfway through. They're clearly off pace in big passing plays and just big plays in general. And any mistakes in this game could be magnified because if you're talking a spread of two or three points, um, Max Johnson and and Joe Milton have to play a clean game. And that and that's where I think Milton's mobility could really come into play here, just escaping some of those AM pass rushes and being able to maybe hit a player or two downfield. So I think this is a a moment for Joe Milton. If he steps up and has a good game, I think Tennessee can win this game and, and they're favored. So that I guess it wouldn't be an upset, but I guess it kind of seems like one uh, mm-hmm. kind of, kind of with A&M strengths in this matchup. Now, how about on the flip side, Stephen, uh, Texas A&M? Um, I believe Tennessee led the SEC in sacks and tackle for loss heading into their bye week. I, I believe A&M has surpassed them in sacks now, but of course they've, they've played an extra game. But if A&M's offensive line, can hold up on the road against uh, and it you know I'm not again that I said that because I I'm not saying Tennessee is like some awful team or anything I mean they'll get after you that that's what they want to do 
But if if we're back to back weeks here, where Max Johnson, I mean Alabama laid into him. If Tennessee does the same, and our A and M's offensive line struggles, and many teams come into Neyland Stadium, they can't handle it. Um, how how big of a concern is that? I mean, is that one of the critical factors for the game? You think? I think so. Uh, also, I think if you're A and M, would you be worried about the theory of like the the Alabama Georgia physicality in the opponents after so now you're going on the road to play Tennessee after an off week after you just played a very physical kind of high emotion game against Alabama I think that would worry me if I'm Texas A&M um, I think the spot here for Tennessee can favor them just because of the emotions in the home crowd. And I think to to your point, you know, you look 1.9 yards per carry rushing against Alabama, but it wasn't just the the lack of a run game. It's it was the pressure constantly on Max Johnson. I think Max Johnson has time to sit and throw. I don't think there's any question that he can pick apart Tennessee secondary with the weapons that Texas A&M has and the question marks that Tennessee has in the secondary. So, I think line of scrimmage for both teams, I mean, is going to be critical here to give their quarterback a chance. Want to take a break from the show to remind you that we are brought to you by my bookie online sports book. Head on over to mybookie.ag today. There's a link in the show notes, head on over there, sign up with the promo code that S E C T H A T S E C for a 50% initial deposit bonus all the way up to a thousand bucks. This is the number one way to help the podcast this college football season. We don't ask for much. We just want you to go over to my bookie, sign up, use that promo code, that SEC, to get an instant 50% deposit match. We keep ads to a minimum. We do that for a reason. We do it for you. We do it for the user experience. It hurts us financially. You can pay us back by setting up a new account at mybookie.ag today. And don't forget, most importantly, that promo code, that S-E-C-T-H-A-T-S-E-C. Get your 50% initial deposit all the way up to 1000 bucks over at MyBookie. And there is a link in the show notes to hook us up. We're also brought to you by The Rogue Shop. Head on over to rogueshop.com. CBD, THC, 100% legal. The, uh, they'll send it to you in a discreet package. Cannot recommend The Rogue Shop enough. Promo code SEC, get you 10% off your entire order and free shipping on orders over 100 bucks. You, you can't beat that deal when it comes to THC and CBD. They sent us a care package over here. Could not be more thrilled with this product. This is a small business, veteran-owned, hemp made in the U.S. of A. You got anxiety. You got sleep issues. You got pain in your muscle and joints. Our friends over at therogueshop.com will take care of you. Head on over to their website. Check out the number of products. Edibles. They got flour. They got topicals. They got you covered at therogueshop.com. Take advantage of these sponsorship opportunities. Help the podcast stay independent. All right, how about this matchup, Stephen? Missouri at Kentucky, where each has now one loss in conference play, can't afford another. This was a game last year, Stephen, went down to that stupid punt that went over the Kentucky punter's head, and he ran backwards 50 yards, and apparently you can rough a punter 50 yards back. I I learned something new last season, but um, the, you know, no love loss. These are these are two physical teams. They get after it. Thoughts on this one, Stephen? Missouri at Kentucky. I really do think uh, you know. Again, you you lose this game, season's not over. But any thoughts of a dream season are dashed. I think for the loser, for sure. I think it's. It's not out of the question that the winner of this game finished his second in the SEC East. I mean, Tennessee is going to have a lot to say about it, but the, the the this game could be important for tiebreaker purposes at the end of the year. You know, Kentucky has won seven of eight against Missouri in the last two games decided by one score. So this this is setting up for another uh, close one on, on Saturday. I think the key for me is going to be the play of Devin Leary. You look at his numbers in SEC play, 
completing about 46% of his passes and 5.4 yards per attempt. I Coming into the season, I thought Missouri's secondary was going to be a strength this year. They're actually 96 nationally in defensive pass success rate. Kentucky's 117th. So I think both of these defenses are, I think, on paper are pretty good. But based upon the numbers, there's going to be some opportunity here for both teams. If you're Missouri, you're looking at, hey, Carson Beck came out and threw for 300 yards early in this game. If we can get Brady Cook and Luther Burden going, there's some opportunities here. And then on the flip side, if you're Kentucky and Devin Leary, you know, after watching Mark Stoops be angry about it during the game, after the game, and now on uh, early in the week leading up to this game, I think there should be some motivation here for Devin Leary to maybe have one of his better games uh, of the season. But this, this to me, looks on paper like a pretty even matchup uh, with teams coming off a loss and eager to rebound as well. Yeah, any danger, Stephen, of um, just the, all the momentum kind of coming out for for the loser of this game? Because I don't know about you, but I'm a huge believer in momentum uh, in college football. I mean, these are young players that are, you know, there's just so many examples where hell, Missouri in the you know first two weeks, I mean, they they looked sloppy. They didn't look that good. And then you beat a Kansas State. You know, you you start to catch fire. You you beat Memphis. I mean, and then all of a sudden you're you're thinking, can can we win the division? You know what I mean? But you you drop two in a row, then it, the sky's falling. And, and the same thing with Kentucky. I mean. I can't tell you how many Kentucky fans I talked to, Stephen, and I was, I'm was i just as guilty, but I thought they could play with Georgia. And a lot of Kentucky fans thought they stood a good chance to win in Athens. And like you said, that game, that game was over in the first quarter. So imagine that and then losing at home. I think there's – and you're right. I mean, the winner of this very likely could be – the second best team in the East. So the, I'm not saying these are bad teams, but I think the loser very well could finish fourth or fifth in the East. But would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. I think it's, I mean, I, I think putting everything aside, like for divisional purposes, like to your point on momentum, I mean, we get 12 Saturdays of football during the regular season. And some of these teams are completely different teams from, Week one to two to three to four. I mean, look at Florida. I mean, how many different times have we seen a different version of Florida come out and play this year? So, yeah, I think positive momentum, you know, can really help one of these teams down the stretch. I mean, you look at what Kentucky has coming up. They have an off week after the Missouri game, but then it, right after that, it's, you know, Tennessee at Mississippi State and then at Alabama. So, you know, then Missouri's got to play South Carolina and, and still to play Georgia. So I think if you win this game, the sort of psychology is, you know, you're still in it, um, even though it's a long shot to beat Georgia, but even still like beating a team that's sort of in that same conversation could be huge. Um, like we said, for tiebreaker purposes, getting to second place in the SEC East, but also just in general, like the snowball effect of if you lose two in a row, it could really kind of spiral uh, here down the stretch because both of these teams have a lot of toss-up games on their schedule still remaining. Mm-hmm. All right, how about this one? Another SEC East showdown, Stephen. Florida at South Carolina. South Carolina's had two weeks to prepare. Florida, I thought, was going into a trap game, even though it was at home against Vanderbilt. But it was anything but. I mean, they they more or less dominated the Commodores, which they should have. But a big win there for Florida. Now, they go on the road, night game, sell out. It's going to be a very, very difficult environment. This is uh, one South Carolina desperately needs to get the season trending in the right direction. And I, I hate to keep kind of repeating myself here, Stephen, but Florida, no disrespect to South Carolina, but this may be the least challenging game they have uh basically the rest of the season you know just looking at the schedule here and again that is this is no gimme i mean college football playoff contenders have walked into williams bryce and got embarrassed so it could happen to florida too on saturday what's your thoughts on this uh east showdown i, I was gonna say I, I i think people around the sec know how tough it is to play at south carolina at night I don't know that people nationally know 
that maybe don't keep up with the SEC as close as we do, how tough it's going to be on Saturday night. When I when I started thinking about this game, I was thought I said, you know, Florida probably has the edge at the line of scrimmage. South Carolina's got the better quarterback, but South Carolina's got better special teams. They got the home field advantage, and they've got revenge on their mind uh, because of what happened last year in Gainesville. They've won two out of three against Florida in Columbia. So I think when to your point on the schedule, it, this is definitely if if there's a path to bowl eligibility for Florida, it has to start here. South Carolina's got two road games after this, but then they get the last four at home. So uh, are in our conversation about momentum here. You now you're starting to look at the second half of the schedule and which one of these teams could maybe get to six, seven wins. You know, if you're South Carolina, you win this one and you can finish up with uh, four very winnable games at home down the stretch. I think you have to feel uh, pretty good if you're Shane Beamer, but we've entered that territory too of, you know, South Carolina makes the jump every year under Shane Beamer, whereas year one or year two, they seem to get better every late October and November. We're entering that territory. So coming off a of bye week, have they been able to find any answers on the offensive line? Uh, just general improvement, I think, will be some areas that I'm watching because they are going to have to be a lot better at the line of scrimmage to beat Florida on Saturday. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the key to the game. And uh, again, going back to repeating myself, uh, it, it seems like the key to Florida's season is just, can they run the ball? Because if they can, they probably win. If they can't, I don't think they have a, a prayer, particularly on the road, to win. Bill, Billy Napier, again, he's, uh, you know, it's well documented, one in seven on outside of the swamp as Florida's head coach. Yet South Carolina, I mean, they've been a train wreck trying to stop the run. Who, who is favored in that aspect? Florida's uh, basically. I guess what I'm asking you: Do you think Florida will? will have success against South Carolina's uh, run defense. I think so. I think that I, I'm a big numbers guy. And as and if and I, when I see uh, South Carolina's 12th in the SEC against the run and 100th nationally in defensive success rate against the run, immediately that tells me Florida should have some success running the ball. However, I do think there are some things we need to watch here. You know, Florida was down two offensive line starters against Vanderbilt and they missed Trevor Etienne. Didn't they? They didn't need those guys to beat Vanderbilt, but going on the road to play South Carolina, they will need a full allotment up front and at running back uh, to win this game. So I think if you're a South Carolina fan, I think one of the things that I'm going to be watching for early on is what's the yardage on second and third down. If I'm South Carolina, I want to see second and eight, third and seven. I don't want to see second and four third and two those are that's that's winning football for florida here and allows them to be efficient in the passing game if you're seeing consistent third and long situations in your south carolina's defense you're feeling really good about the trajectory of this game early on any thoughts on um, austin armstrong as a defensive coordinator for florida versus uh who's, who's a very young guy i think he's 30 years old and then we got dow loggins who i think has been 30 years in the nfl or some crazy like that but obviously a different spectrum here uh even though Dow's you know he's not wildly experienced in the college game but that that's an interesting matchup to me Stephen uh, Armstrong likes to be very aggressive yet South Carolina's got a veteran quarterback who's seen it all who's playing you know obviously didn't have his best game against Tennessee but still they they would have nothing without him um he, he's he's just he's worked in so many different offensive systems uh, th thoughts on that matchup because that, that that'll be critical in this game as well. Yeah, it really is. Also, we should note that both defenses only have nine sacks this year. So, in a game where the margins are probably pretty small, can one of these defenses create some havoc? And 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 to that point, you know, Austin Armstrong, I think, you know, is kind of an aggressive coordinator wants to be aggressive on that side of the ball, this would be a good chance to dial it up, uh, knowing South Carolina's question marks on the offensive line. And South Carolina can probably counter um, with Rattler and sort of that short passing game to get it out of his hands and let the playmakers, you know, make space and plays. I think on on um, Dow Logan specifically, I think what I'm looking for here is it felt like South Carolina had started to find some answers on the offensive line before the Tennessee game. You know, they went down to Georgia and they started to play some freshmen on the line. They've had some injuries since then. You know, can they, did they over the bye week, did they find five that they feel good about that's healthy 
that can protect Rattler. And then whether it's Mario Anderson, whether it's to carry on Joyner, can they get any semblance of a running game? They need a little bit more consistency. Uh, Anderson had the big play against Tennessee, but there wasn't enough consistency from rush to rush. So I think in this coordinator battle, I'm curious to see if you're, if you're South Carolina, can you find a little bit more running game? Can you maybe hit a big player or two in the passing game? And how is South Carolina holding up against the pass rush of Florida? That's where I think the Loggins uh, Armstrong matchup could really come down to. Hmm. How about this uh, SEC West showdown, Stephen Auburn at LSU? And uh, I think a lot of people, Stephen, are going to look at this matchup and just gloss over it. LSU, one of the best offenses in the country. Probably the number one Heisman candidate out of the SEC and Jaden Daniels. Not trying to take away anything from them, but Auburn's had two weeks to prepare for this game. Hugh Freeze, veteran of the SEC. Um, I wish I had his bye week uh, numbers, but I I have to imagine they're probably pretty good because he's a good coach. Uh, They gave Georgia a hell of a time. I know that was at home, but that was the toughest game Georgia's faced all year. And I was told, Stephen, even before that Georgia game, of course, maybe they just maybe they just implemented it all for Georgia because it because they look like a different team. But I was told heading into the bye, there was going to be changes made to where it was a quarterback or play caller or both. Uh, so I, I think Auburn's going to throw out some tricks in this game. And I'm I'm not asking you to pick it or anything, but. As crazy as this sounds, I would not be shocked if Auburn wins this football game. Uh, what's your thoughts? I would not be surprised if this one is much closer than people are thinking too. Um, you know, first of all, you look at this series. You know, LSU four and two over the last six against um, Auburn. Five of those are decided by one score, and mm-hmm. it's been tough. You know, it's been tough for Auburn to to win at LSU as it is for for most most teams. I think they've won one time in Death Valley since 2000. So the the trend line here says to take LSU. Last game, of course, was was close to. I think the strangest matchup of this all is the LSU defense, which has stopped nobody. Going against Auburn's <laughs> offense, which has done nothing all year. So, like, which one is out? Like, is it this defense that can stop anybody, or is it an offense that's got nothing uh, going on all year? If you want to make, you know, if you want some positivity for LSU's defense, Missouri scored on just two of its last eight drives. So, I mean, maybe they figured something out in the second half. We'll have to. I think we'll have to. We'll know a lot more uh, by Saturday. But it's also hard to know too much because of the struggles. That Auburn's had. And, you know, I think in the big picture, you've seen sort of this emphasis by LSU to do more with its defensive front. And they've got to like Mason Smith and Harold Perkins have just going to have to create more havoc uh, to help that secondary. So I'm I'm curious if how Auburn looks offensively, because I'm with you. I think coming off of the off week, there will probably be some changes. There should be some some new wrinkles to the offense the the crazy thing about the passing game is when you watch Auburn at times the passes are hitting the receivers in the hands and they just need to catch them and make the plays um Peyton Thorne or Ashford so at times the passing game has been there there just needs to be a little bit more consistency in the receiving core and from quarterback so I think we'll I think Auburn out of the bye week is dangerous here uh, the other factor that kind of weighs for me in this one is LSU has now played two games back to back where they went or three Arkansas, uh, the game against Ole Miss and Missouri, where essentially they went down to the the final play. So at home, you're not necessarily worried about if they have anything in the tank, if they were on the road, I think it'd be a different story, but I think the emotions Auburn is fresh. LSU's played a couple games that have gone down to the wire. Does it mean anything on Saturday? Yeah. And to your point, I mean, they won the Missouri game, Stephen, because they forced two turnovers LSU. Uh, but they played fairly clean. I don't. I can't recall if they had a turnover. I don't think they did. But they didn't. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah. I didn't think they did. But th- that's my point, Stephen. I mean, when your defense is that awful, but credit them for making plays. Again, they they made two turnovers that won them the game. And, and uh, well, obviously the offense playing lights out. But what if your offense doesn't doesn't? And and that 
I mean, again, I guess Auburn, they're going to score. They're going to have success. But what if you flip that? What if they're the ones? You know, when you're stressing, when you have to make a play every time because you know your defense may just give it up just as easily, you you make a misread. You you drop, you, you fumble, you throw a pick, what have you. Um, I mean, I, I think that starts to wear on you too. And th- that's all it's going to take, Stephen, is one mistake, two mistake. And all of a sudden, if Auburn plays mistake free, that's how they're going to sneak up and get you. Um, I I don't know. I mean, I guess, I guess we're just saying the same thing here. But I with this defense, until it's cleaned up, they could beat anybody they play with that offense. They could lose to anybody with this defense. Would, would you agree with that? Uh, agree. Also, I think maybe the angle that you're going for here is if you're Auburn and you have the backfield – and you have Peyton Thorne, who ran the ball well against Georgia, and you have Robbie Ashford, you might just try and play keep away to some extent because if LSU can't stop you and you shorten the game, especially with the new uh, clock rules, the few few little, not as there's not going to be as many plays, maybe you can keep a possession down. You know, there's a chance to change this game. I think the higher scoring it is, it probably benefits LSU. If you, Auburn, you want to turn it into a slugfest where you're keeping Jaden Daniels off the field, limiting possessions. I mean, Auburn's defense, you know, held their own against Georgia. Uh, this is obviously a group that still has some issues to sort through this year. Uh, but if if you can lower the possessions by LSU, don't give up some big plays, your offense can take some time, run the ball, um, you know, maybe there is a chance here uh, for Auburn to keep things interesting deep into the game. I do think for LSU, one factor that could also help their defense is on offense. And that's Logan Diggs. Like he's getting more involved every week. And so they can maybe try to play a little bit uh, slower or get the ground game going just to take some pressure off the defense at this point. Mm. Uh, how about uh, Arkansas at Alabama, Stephen? I'm, Arkansas's not won this game since, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think uh, how long, since uh, Bill Clinton was in office or something like that. So, uh <laughs> Uh, I mean, can they make it competitive? Here's the thing. I know Arkansas fans are freaking out. We got fire everybody. We're awful. Uh, you should see how many comments, Stephen. We, we should be dead last in the power rankings and all this. You know, they're not getting whipped every week. They, yeah, they're losing, and that's all that really matters. But they're competitive. They're fighting. And, uh, I mean, they're in all these games. And it's just going to get tougher going in Tuscaloosa. I get it. But something also we've talked about, Stephen, I mean – Alabama's having turnovers, all these penalties, and it's this this is not vintage Saban team, and, and they're they're squeaking by. Uh, I, they'll probably do it again. They'll probably do it all damn season because I'm gonna keep running my mouth. But uh, any shot that Arkansas can can make us a p- competitive game, I think it's tough. But I think this game probably just on the surface, knowing how. Alabama has played this season and the offensive line issues of Arkansas, it's probably not going to be a high scoring game. I, mean, I think the odds of it being kind of ugly, low scoring type probably make a lot of sense. Uh, you know, you, you were mentioning how, how long it's been. I think it's been like 16 in a row and only like four of them have been decided by one score. So there've been better Arkansas teams here that haven't been able to, to test Alabama this season. I, I think, you know, on Arkansas, they have played now four incredibly difficult games. Um, LSU, AM, Ole Miss, and now Alabama. I think to their credit, they have fought for the most part in these games. The AM won, got a little bit, you know, a little bit more one sided on the scoreboard. I think if you're making the case, well, how can Arkansas stay in this game? I think defensively, I think they've improved quite a bit. I mean, five point five yards per play. They gave up 6.5 last year. So they're a whole yard better this season so far uh, than they were last year. And I think their defense, with the way that Alabama is still not functioning as they would like to on the offensive line and with the run game, you know, if you can get this offense into some third and longs, you know, maybe you have a chance to to make this one interesting. Jalen Milrow is coming off his best game at, at Texas A&M uh, by far. And I... I I'm curious to see if that spirals into something even better this week. You know, can he get back to running the ball more? Does he have another huge performance through the air? So I think if you're 
if you're Arkansas, to me, the path is, you know, win the line of scrimmage and you have to hope KJ Jefferson just has a huge game, whether it's rushing, whether it's throwing, he's the X factor here. And then I think for Alabama, I think you want to see Milrow continue to, to make that jump. And can you get anything uh, offensive line run game going, uh, kind of get that group going as you enter the second half of the season is still a question mark for me. Yeah. Uh, and then last one, Stephen, Georgia. It's listed at at Vanderbilt, but it's really – it's home game for Vanderbilt, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, I mean, not, not that this requires a lot of analysis here, but uh, maybe – the spread. The spread's 29, 30 points, wherever you, where you're getting. How how can Vanderbilt cover the spread, Steve? <laughs> oh, man. Um, hope Georgia doesn't show up. Uh, <laughs> hope it rains. Hope it's windy. Hope uh, hope Kirby just to sit out the starters in the second half. <laughs> uh, you know, the timing of this game for Vanderbilt maybe plays into some of that. You know, coming off the big game against Kentucky. Georgia, through the first couple weeks of the season, was a little sluggish. I still think that this team turned a corner after the Auburn game and they totally dominated against Kentucky. And I think that's probably the Georgia that we'll see the rest of the year. Maybe the optimism is the backdoor cover. I mean, maybe Vanderbilt <laughs> just scores a couple times in the fourth quarter with Georgia's second and third stringers in. I, I, I wish I had more reasons for optimism here if you're a Vanderbilt fan, but two and five and just issues and line of scrimmage, Secondary, it's going to be hard to stop um, Georgia. I think a little, little, little tip of the cap though to Ken Seals at quarterback. Though you know he, he, you know he lost his starting job to AJ Swan and and others, and he's kind of been around the program for a couple of years. And he's, I thought he's acquitted himself pretty well for a guy that's you know he hasn't started in a while. And and to go against uh, you know uh, the last couple of weeks as a starter, I think a little tip of the cap to how he's played too. Now, wait a second, Stephen. I don't know if you saw this last week, but Kirby said every SEC team should be ranked and they can all beat us. And that we're sitting here was a 30 point spread. So I guess you should Vanderbilt be ranked? <laughs> I can't even say that without laughing. <laughs> Respectfully to Kirby Smart, <laughs> um, I would not not rank Vanderbilt. I think they are in the 90s in my power rankings right now. Uh, they are, the, I think, the lowest rated uh, <laughs> team in the, in the, uh, the country. I will say it's a nice uh, opportunity for Kirby to try to pump up the SEC. The the, the propaganda machines are going to start spinning as we get into playoff uh, season. You remember Les Miles saying they were undefeated <laughs> in regulation, so that's why they had to be the title game. So we're going to hear more of this coming up. Don't, don't worry. Uh, let, let me ask you this, Stephen, and, and let's remove that Georgia Vanderbilt and Arkansas Alabama because you could give me those f for these questions and they'd be easy. But but I I really want to ask you, what win would really help the most for the goals that these programs have? And again, just talking SEC, just talking this week. And and we're removing, you know, Vanderbilt beating Georgia would be that would be massive. Uh, Arkansas beating Alabama would be massive, but those seem so, uh, you know, far fetched to a degree. The other four is where I'm really leaning: A and M at Tennessee, Missouri at Kentucky, Florida at South Carolina, Auburn at LSU. What win, and it could be any of those eight, helps propel that team to to reach. Uh, you know, the goals that they currently have, do you think? I think it's the winner of Missouri and Kentucky just because of the stakes in the SEC East. And knowing that Georgia has already taken care of Kentucky, they look like the, the clear front runner in the East. You know, maybe the argument is if you're Missouri, hey, we played them close last year. We go on the road and beat Kentucky. Let us let us have a shot at them later in the season before you, you go ahead and print the SEC East uh, T-shirts later this season. So I think the winner of that game, you know, it's important to the to the goals. But, you know, each one of these, the storylines are interesting. For, for me, I look at Auburn. If they win this game on Saturday, all of a sudden, you know, the, the rebuilding plan by Hugh Freeze would be on track. You would have played Georgia to the wire. You would have gone on the road and beat LSU flip it around if you're LSU you win this game you're just keeping pace with Alabama you're setting up that massive showdown um, on November 4th in Tuscaloosa Tennessee 
You know, it's it's the same thing in the East, trying to keep pace with Missouri and Kentucky. If A&M loses this game, you know, already at three losses and still have to play Ole Miss and LSU. So that goal of getting to nine and three, maybe 10 and two, I mean, it's right here on the wire for, for A&M. So I, I think there's a lot here this weekend. This These are, I would say these, a lot of these games are probably not going to be, you know, top five nationally showdowns. But to me, there's a lot of intrigue on all these games this weekend. And I never ask you, Stephen, I hope you appreciate this. I never ask you to pick these games on Monday because I know how much work you put in. And and I I don't know about you, but I hate picking early. So I'm not going to ask you to pick any of these. Unless you already made up your mind, you can feel free to reveal that. But um, is, is there – and again, we're removing Georgia and Vanderbilt and Arkansas, Alabama. It, those other four, is there one team among those eight and again, we're recording this Monday evening, so you, you, you by all means have right to to change your pick later in the week. Uh, but is there one of those games that you feel most confident that you know who the winner is of of those four more toss up type games? I would probably say LSU. I just think of the other ones, they seem a little bit more toss up since it's our word of the season so far. <laughs> I think I, I think I. Uh, I think Auburn's going to make it interesting, but I would probably take LSU in that question. I will say, if you want my predictions, and I'll give them to you. Take them for what they're worth. They're early in the week. I'm probably going to take Tennessee, Kentucky, and South Carolina in those other games in LSU. Well, yeah, let me ask you the flip then. Which which of the – and I guess we'll just go stick with the three, the non-LSU-Auburn one. Which, which of those three remaining, A&M, Tennessee, Missouri, Kentucky, Florida – at South Carolina, are you least confident that you know who the winner is from those three? Is it is there anybody that stands out? I think it's Texas A&M and Tennessee. I mean, <laughs> I, I've I've tried like I have thought about this game probably more than a human should at various hours <laughs> of the night. Uh, you know, so if there's that guy that's thinking about Tennessee and uh, Texas A&M at two in the morning, it's me. Um, <laughs> I think I'm I'm just like, I'm curious like A and M the response after losing to Alabama, Tennessee off the bye week the quarterback battle the line of scrimmage, I thought that A and M like I said might be favored in here in this game but the fact that Tennessee is um, I guess not surprising because they're at home but I kind of figured that the power ratings would have Texas A and M maybe a little bit higher but I think this is just a it's an intriguing game from a matchup standpoint a storyline standpoint and also sort of the program uh growth goals for both because i think if a&m loses this game we start to wonder about direction of the program again considering where this the schedule could lead them later this season yeah uh any closing thoughts on the week ahead in the sec or even midway point anything uh before we get you out of here I think the biggest thing is I'm I'm looking forward to all these games uh, this weekend. You know, I conf- I said it before. Conference play is my favorite uh, time of the year because all these teams have played each other, you know, for years every years, and we have all these crazy rivalry numbers and things like that. So I'm looking forward to to the conference, um, continuing the conference season, continuing to to learn about these games. Um, but man, I'm just the A and M Tennessee game is completely mysterious to me, and I cannot wait on Saturday to figure <laughs> out uh, to fill in that missing puzzle piece uh, uh, this weekend. You know, the only thing there's there's one thing that's going to make weekends like this even better, Stephen. Hit me with it when we throw in Texas and Oklahoma. I mean, my goodness! Imagine if it's you know uh, Oklahoma at LSU, and oh by the way. Uh, Texas is going to Tennessee this week. You know, like it's like, my God, that's a conference game. This feels like a playoff game. I mean, think think about what we talked about earlier with those two teams. They're in the top ten. <laughs> the SEC is adding two top ten teams next year. Where Texas is trending up, Oklahoma's trending up. Uh, the schedules. I mean, it's a good thing that there's a 12 team playoff for the SEC next year because they're going to need it with uh, with how many good teams they're going to have here. Yeah, without a doubt. Well, Stephen, I can't thank you enough for uh, for joining us. Before you go, as always, can you tell the audience how can they follow you? How can they find your work? Absolutely. So, as always, thanks for having me on. Uh, it's my favorite part of the week to get to talk to you and talk some SEC ball. You can follow me on Twitter at Athlon Stephen. You can follow me on uh, Facebook 
Instagram, Threads, TikTok, Stephen L. CFB, all CFB 365 on YouTube. And I co-host the Cover 2 podcast uh, on Athlon Sports. We release it every Wednesday. We'd love for you to check it out. Cover 2 podcast, uh, wherever you get your uh, podcast as well. All right, buddy. Thanks again. And uh, can't wait for next week. Can't think. Thanks again for having me. All right. So just want to say thanks again, Stephen, for joining the show. And, uh, you know, shout out. He mentioned uh, the Cover 2 podcast. I listen to every episode. It's Stephen Lassen and our buddy Braden Gall that I do the uh, weekly live show. So check that out. If you got time on Tuesday, we go 1 o'clock Eastern, noon Central time every Tuesday. Braden and I on the YouTube channel come by. That's a little bit more off the cuff. I like Braden to be the host on that one. And I just, it's like an hour long find bomb interview is what it is for me. So check that out on Tuesday if you got the time. But uh, hey, we do appreciate each and every one of you for checking us out. And uh, hey, we'll be on back on the next episode with Cousin Shane. We got a little different format since we're at the midway point of the SEC season. Trying to, uh, you know, we don't, we don't want to... We're trying not to have this be the same old, same old week in and week out. So we got something cooking for you. So be on the lookout next episode. I think you're really going to enjoy it. But that's all I got on this one. We'll catch you on the next one.